Good morning, everyone. So we have a little bit more from chapter six, just a couple more slides. Uh, the, the last like six or so slides are some applications of chapter six, just a couple quick things we might talk about. Um, and then after that, we're going to get into some review uh, questions. Review questions are posted uh, on the lecture slides page that I'm gonna do here in class today and into Monday. And so let's start today with the uh, electron configuration at 10. And so if we're trying to do our electron configuration, we could start from 1s2, 2s2, and it's not necessarily um, a bad start just to kind of go back to the very basics to make sure that we're on the same page with just kind of following along the periodic table. You can kind of see the S block, the P block. And so we're going 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Of course, all of that would be argon so far. Um, and then we go 4s2. And then the first time we have a D is three. So usually the, the big thing is making sure we see that that's a 3D, not a 4D or some other number in front of D. Um, and then we go 10 across the D block. We get all the way across the next P block with six electrons. And then, you know, the next number would be five. So five S2, we get all the way across the next D block, which would be the four D 10. And then we're ending with the five P2. So sometimes it's really just making sure you see how you determine these numbers here is just that they're following a line from the previous um, elements above 10. So if we were looking at uh, germanium, it would be like a 4p2 configuration. So we're just kind of going from 4p to 5p, et cetera. Um, and so then in terms of like counting our valence electrons, these are our valence shell orbitals, the, the, the 5s2 and the... Uh, uh, 5p2, the outermost shell electrons. So we're going to have four valence electrons, these four electrons here. And then the, the D block, that 4d10, once it's filled, completely filled, it's in like the lower subshell. So um, it's in the lower n equals 4 shell. It's completely filled. So we're not counting these towards the valence shell anymore. And also, we mentioned before, if you knew carbon had four valence electrons, then you should know everything in carbon's group has four valence electrons. And so 10 should have four valence electrons. Our valence diagram would be our 5s2 and then our 5p2. So we'd have two electrons in the S, uh, 5s orbital. And then we'd have two electrons in two different uh, 5p orbitals. And so this here, using two orbitals, spin pairing the electrons in the same direction, that's Hund's rule. So a violation of Hund's rule might be something that looks like this. So this would be a Hund's rule violation because we haven't maximized the spin. Um, and so that would be a Hund's rule violation. Um, a poly exclusion principle would be if we took any of these electrons and like paired them in the same orbital in the same direction. So that would be portraying the same electron in the same space. So that would be a poly exclusion principle violation. So each electron has to have its own unique set of quantum numbers. Um, and so then another Hund's rule violation would be if we use this configuration. And I think that one's bad because we're just putting two electrons closer together and not spreading them out. So we want electrons to be more diffuse if we, if we have the option. So we want to use um, as many of the p orbitals as possible, maximizing the spin. And so that's what our valence diagram looks like. And then we notice that we have two electrons that don't have their spins paired together. So we have two total unpaired electrons for this atom. And so unpaired electron counting is usually what we ask for just to make sure we have the right configuration. So you'll see a lot of questions that just get at unpaired electron counts. And those are really just getting at, do you have the proper uh, diagram of electrons and also the proper electron configuration? Um, let's do, uh, or, or let's look here and then we'll do like a bigger atom like uranium or something like that. And so once we get across 10, so 10 would be right here, we'd get into the 6s block and then if we're following this periodic table here, you see uh, lanthanum comes next, 57, then cerium, 58, and then we're going down across the F block. So we're filling into the F block next. Now, why lanthanum on this periodic table is shown in like what looks like the D block is kind of peculiar. Um, it's, it's just the next element, and then we're just looking forward from there. So if I'm looking at lanthanum, I'm going to lanthanum 57, we would expect the configuration to be the 6s2 following the nearest preceding noble gas, the xenon. So we'd expect a xenon configuration followed by 6s2 
and then followed by a 4F1. Now, in, in a second, we're going to see it's actually a 5D1 and not a 4F1. And that we're going to see that there's, for a lot of these elements in the F block, that they can swap electrons with the D shell, but we're not creating or destroying electrons, we're just moving them into different orbitals. And so this one ends up being a 5D1, not something you need to memorize, but I think that's why they put lanthanum here. It's kind of like almost foreshadowing that it's actually a D block where its last electron's going into. And then the next elements kind of either go into the F block or they share some in the F, some in the D block. And we'll take a look at a chart in a minute and kind of compare and see um, how widespread this problem is in the F block. But generally we're filling into the F block next, 14 elements across because seven times two, seven F orbitals, two electrons each. So we go 14 across here. And then afterwards we go back to the 5D shell. So we start filling into the 5D block and then 6P, and then we go back to 7S, 5F, 6D, 7P. Now, the, you know, lanthanum and actinum series elements, not very common in a chemistry class, so you're not gonna see a ton of examples, but just to make sure that we can kind of see uh, an element, uranium, uh, element number 92, if we had to get to our expected electron configuration for this element, we're kind of backing up to the nearest preceding noble gas now, radon. And so then we'd go 7s2, takes us through francium and uh, uh, radium. And then we're going 1, 2, 3, 4 into the F block. So that'd be a 5F4. And so, you know, we're just following the 5F after the 4F. So kind of just picturing the first F block is 4. So the first time we have an F block is the 4F block. So the top row, the, the lanthanum series is filling into the 4F, and then the actinum series is filling into the 5F subshell. And so that would be our expected configuration for something like uranium. Okay, now let's take a look and kind of take an, a quick inspection of where the configurations are exactly what we expect and where some of them are a little bit different from what we expect. These P block elements are all exactly as we expect. If you notice, that they all go, you know, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, and this is the same the whole way down. That there's no what we call anomalies. There's nothing in the P subshell elements where there's any configurations that aren't exactly what you expect them to be. And the same thing with the S block. <clears throat> so if you look in the um, uh, alkali and alkaline group elements, they're all NS1s, NS2s with no variation. So there's, there's no inconsistencies with what we expect for things like sodium and magnesium in their groups. And if you look at most of the, um, the D block, you see that they mostly fall in suit. So scandium D1, titanium D2, vanadium D3, and then look at chromium. Chromium goes 4S1, 3D5. Now, the only way we can explain this is kind of, if you think of Bohr model, when you go from N equals one to N equals two to N equals three to N equals four, you know how the energy levels start getting closer together? Well, for our multi-electron atoms, you start getting to a point where the S and the D block are relatively similar in energy, and then it must turn out that certain configurations just have more stability. So there must be something special about having that half-filled S block and that half-filled D block that adds some stability to that particular configuration, and that is the one that chromium adopts. Now, I don't expect you to memorize chromium does this. In fact, if you look down the periodic table, molybdenum does the same thing. It does the 5S14D5, but then tungsten doesn't. So it is really kind of challenging to kind of see that this isn't entirely periodic. Um, and so then let's just kind of continue along and see which configurations are what we expect versus different. Manganese is exactly what we'd expect. It goes back to being the, the D5, 4S2, D6 for uh, iron, D7, nickel is exactly as we expect, and we get the copper, and it goes ahead and caps off the D subshell and goes to 4S1. Why? Hard to explain, hard to understand. It just does this as its base configuration. Now again, I'm not going to expect you to know that copper does this. I'm not going to expect that you memorize which elements have these anomalies and which don't, uh, because a lot of times it can be periodic. Like this particular anomaly is the same the whole way down, well, at least until you get to this element here. But a lot of the elements beyond uranium are short-lived or synthesized in a lab. And so their properties aren't entirely known anyway. So once you get into some of these elements here, not all that much is really known about them. 
But anyways, so we see this trend for copper's group turns out to be periodic, at least for three of the four elements in the group. The D10s are, I think we would expect the D10s would all be D10s still, that there's no anomalies in the zinc, cadmium, mercury group. Sometimes those are called the noble transition metals because they're kind of like capping off their D subshells. Um, but so then the nickel group to me is kind of funny. If we circle back to nickel exactly as we expected, 4S2, 3D8, look at palladium. Palladium goes ahead and grabs a full D subshell and goes 4D10. So it moves what should have been S electrons into the D subshell. So we didn't create or destroy electrons, we just moved them from one subshell to another. And then if we look at platinum, it moves one of them, which like makes no sense at all. You know, so nickel is exactly as we expect. Palladium moves two over for a filled D subshell. And then for some reason, platinum said, you know what, I want a half filled S and an almost filled D subshell and went um, with the NS1 and D9 configuration. Um, so that, that's kind of peculiar. Then you also see um, ruthenium and rhenium move an S electron over. So again, you're never going to memorize which of the elements do this anomaly, but I think you can appreciate that there must be something with the S and the D subshells, that they're relatively close in energy, and there are certain configurations that must be adding to stability. The book talks a little bit about half and full uh, um, subshells are maybe more stable than other configurations, but you can see that we're moving electrons around for all kinds of reasons, that there's, there's really not a lot of rhyme or reason to when these anomalies occur. Now, I mentioned there's some in the F block too, so lanthanum I mentioned was that 5D1, Let's zoom in a little bit here, and, and the, the F block kind of goes back and forth a little bit. Cerium should have been an F2, but it's a D1, F1. Again, I don't expect you to memorize this, but cerium's peculiar. Praseodymium, exactly as we expect, a 4F3. Neodymium, exactly as we expect. Um, actually, PR is, PR or PM is praseodymium. I don't know what the other one is. I'm blanking on it at the moment. But um, this element here, exactly as we expect, and so then when you get across the second half of the F block, you see an anomaly with gadolinium, and then that's about it. So we see one, two, three anomalies, it looks like, in the F block of the 14. So it's not widespread. You know, it's like three of the elements are showing this anomaly. And then we also then see the same type of anomaly start to take place with the 5F block. So we see some anomalies in the 5F block, and this one becomes a little bit more pronounced where we're seeing the electrons moving around between the, um, the 6D and the 4F, or excuse me, the uh, 3, 4, 5, 6D and the 5F subshells. Okay, so, uh, so certain configurations add more stability. What we would expect you to know is if we give you an element, I would expect you to know the quote unquote expected configuration. Um, if we wanted to say, you know, give me the configuration for an element that has an anomaly, it would be a bad question in a way because what if you memorize or happen to know it had an anomaly and we had that choice and the expected choice? Like that would just be a bad question. So if we're gonna ask you for a configuration, it'll either be one that obviously has an expected configuration that you should get from just following the order of the periodic table and the order of filling electrons in, uh, or maybe we'll give you the anomalous configuration and you're just counting electrons. Like if we had said some element has this configuration here, all you're really counting is that you have two plus seven plus one, that's, uh, that's 10 electrons on top of 86, the nearest preceding noble gas of radon. So 86 electrons from the radon configuration plus these 10 go to element number 96. So we can identify if you're given that configuration, like if given one of these anomalous configurations, you can identify what the element is. So if we give you a configuration expected or anomalous, it's very easy to count the electrons to determine what the element is. Okay, so electron configurations. The idea is give us the expected configuration, maybe understand there's some anomalies, and then from either the expected or anomalous configuration, tell us the element just by counting up the electrons. Okay, so one last on chapter six is just looking back at chromium, being told it has this anomalous configuration can we then determine how many unpaired electrons it contains? So from this configuration here, this is really just a matter of the 4s1, one electron, and then one, two, three, four, five. And seeing that we have six unpaired electrons. So 
So we could probably say something like, you know, chromium has an anomalous configuration and it has six unpaired electrons. What's its configuration? And then you could probably get into this configuration. Or like if we said, you know, palladium, which I believe was a, a D10, like palladium has zero unpaired electrons. What's its configuration? So I think you could take the number of unpaired electrons and work out the configuration from thinking about moving electrons from the expected configuration. So you can kind of see a connection here between unpaired electrons. Now, unpaired electrons are interesting in a way because they make the atom what we call to be like paramagnetic. So in an in, in, uh, atom that has net unpaired electrons should be drawn into a magnetic field, or maybe you can make a permanent magnet out of the substance as well. And so you can start to think about how the unpaired electrons can tell you something about a property of the atom. So something with unpaired electrons drawn into a magnetic field, something without unpaired electrons wouldn't be magnetic or drawn into a magnetic field. So there's some bit of reason why the unpaired electron count's important. Okay, so I had a couple slides just to, to talk. One was about like just the, the thought of DNA damage. So this is an absorption spectrum of DNA. And so you can see that DNA is starting to absorb light in that ultraviolet region kind of just below about 300 nanometers. And so this is probably why in the hot sun you want to wear uh, uh, sunscreen is because sunlight could contain light in that wavelength region and you can start to have DNA, say in your skin, absorb light. And that light, if we think about bond strengths, you know, if we think about the actual like bonds in DNA, light of about 300 nanometers, we've already seen, that's probably about 400 or so kJs per mole of photons. That's enough energy to start breaking bonds. So we can start breaking bonds in DNA when we have light being absorbed in these regions here. Now, light, like this is the most common light that comes through the, the atmosphere is the UVA radiation, but it's really the UVB radiation that you'd be most, uh, that would be most damaging because that's the radiation that would be absorbed by DNA. That's the energy that contains more energy per photon, enough energy to start breaking bonds. And so this is where you want to wear sunscreen to protect yourself from this radiation here. So UVA is not so bad. UVB is harmful. UVC doesn't really make its way to the sun. That's mostly absorbed by the atmosphere. So this is mostly being absorbed by the ozone layer. Um, so not much of UVC makes it to the atmosphere. So the edges of that UVB is what's really harmful. That can start breaking bonds. I think it's like really interesting to think about the photoelectric effect of how as soon as the photon energy is high enough, it has enough energy to start breaking bonds. Um, and then uh, once we start breaking bonds, you start doing damage that is not easy to repair. So just a quick thought on that. This is a picture from the lab I worked in in grad school. This is a uh, um, apparatus you would use to study reactions of what we call cross molecular beams. So we would make uh, a beam of molecules. This is one of the sides of our apparatus where we'd make um, a relatively small beam of molecules. I'll show you a slide in a minute on what that might look like. And then the beam of molecules travels through the chamber. We have on the opposite side another beam where we can create another beam of molecules and they can collide together where a reaction can take place. And so we had all kinds of lasers so we can try to detect the products. We also had lasers that we were using to create the reactants as well. And so what, the, what, what a molecular beam kind of looks like is we had what we called like a pulse valve um, apparatus where we had a device that could like open and then let um, uh, like a pulse of gas out into a chamber that's a vacuum chamber. So as soon as that device opens, the gas just expands very quickly into the vacuum chamber and then travels uh, very quickly. And then you get what we call like a supersonic beam, where the beam has a very, what we call like narrow velocity range distribution. So we create a beam of very fast moving molecules, but all relatively similar velocities. Anybody who's ever seen, and we'll see this in chapter 10 later, like a, a Boltzmann distribution of velocities, at room temperature, a gas would have a very wide range of velocities. So this is a way of taking a gas and having its energy be a very, very narrow range of velocities. And then we can take those, and this, this is just for, to, to really ultimately get at a hydrogen spectrum. You'll see real quick why I'm talking about this. Um, but what we were doing was trying to have hydroxyl radical react with something like H2. We were trying to make water and trying to study the hydrogen products so we could figure out something about the collision that um, took place to form water. And so we were also then using like a deuterated version. So hydrogen two is deuterium. Um, and so we were using deuterium so we can then try to detect the deuterium products so that we wouldn't see some byproducts of the water hydrogen. So we were schematically just using an isotope to try to study the actual events of this reaction. We had a laser with a molecule, very simple molecule of nitric acid that was creating the hydroxyl radical. 
Um, so if you're following, what we would try to do is create hydroxyl radicals. We'd have hydrogen gas or deuterium gas intersecting and colliding, and we were then trying to detect the H or D out. Now where this relates to chapter six is the detection scheme was through what we call like a Rydberg atom formation. So we were trying to create these high energy states of a hydrogen atom. We did that by exciting the hydrogens from 1s to 2p. So we took a hydrogen from its 1s ground state to 2p level. We use a second laser to excite up to what we called a Rydberg state, which was a state of high n value. So one thing that's interesting is we were actually creating hydrogen atoms in these like n equals 40 to 50 range. So you might not have thought that n could get that high, but, but, you, but uh, hydrogen or deuterium can exist with those high n values. And then the other thing that's kind of interesting is that the lifetime's long enough to then allow you to detect the atom. So the atoms were then very easy to detect because they were like almost ions. If you think about the amount of energy it takes to ionize one of these Rydberg atoms, very small amount of energy. So it allowed us to very easily detect something that was almost an ion. If you ever, for some reason, get into chemical physics and want to study this kind of thing, you'll see detecting ions is always problematic because if you try to ionize one thing, you ionize a bunch of things, and it's very hard to separate ions uh, from each other. And so, but it's very easy to separate things that might have been ionized from something that's not ionized. You just put a little screen, and then only the uncharged particles get through. These Rydberg atoms weren't yet ionized. And so we could get them through um, and then just put a small potential on a detector and very easily detect these atoms. Now, the, the, the scheme that I thought was very interesting is if you calculated from the Bohr model, the 2p or the n equals 2 to the n equals 1 energy level, you would get 121.6 nanometers corresponds to that transition. That's the wavelength of laser we were using. And then you could calculate using the Bohr model this difference of energy too from like 2 to 40 to determine the wavelength for the other laser needs to be about 365 nanometers. So this all came back to Bohr model um, on how we were determining what energies for these lasers to use to tag uh, those products. So I just wanted to mention that there was an application that I used from like the Bohr model um, and calculations with it that I was doing to try to figure out uh, these wavelengths. Okay, so that's just meant to show some utility for some of the things we're talking about here in chapter six. Probably the sunscreen is more applicable. I doubt many of you guys will go into chemical physics, but, um, but that work is very fun, very fascinating. So if, that, if you're excited by that, either chemical physics, physical chemistry, molecular beam reactions, um, et cetera, is what that topic was. Okay, so let's circle back to do some review. I wanted to go back to chapter five. We had done a review packet for chapter four already. I do have some more chapter four problems. We'll do those after we look at chapter five and some review on chapter six. And so uh, I wanted to start with a couple of key equations. If you look at the equation sheet that I just sent out yesterday, there's almost nothing from chapter five that you get on the exam in the form of equations. So I just wanted to make sure we maybe understood some equations that probably you won't need to directly use to solve problems. Like for example, work is force times distance. I don't think you're gonna need to solve any equations with this particular uh, you, you won't need to solve any problems with that equation, but the idea here is if you're going to move an object, you have to apply a force to move it a certain distance. This is just showing us what work is. Coulomb's law is the next equation. It's just showing us the relationship of two charges. This equation helps us see that plus and minus, if we bring a plus and a minus together, the energy drops. If we bring a plus and a plus together, the energy goes up. If I have a plus and a plus and I want to separate them, I get energy back. So energy is released by separating two cations or two anions. But if I want to separate a plus and a minus, energy has to be absorbed. So it helps you start to see, will energy be given off? Or um, is energy required to be absorbed for a reaction to take place? So the plus minus has to go upwards. The plus plus would go downwards. And likewise, if you start with the two pluses and bring them together, it goes up. The plus and the minus goes down in relative energy. Um, delta E is E final minus E initial. Most of our deltas in chapter five were final minus initial. Only the very last bond enthalpy calculation is like a reactants minus products. So just making sure we see almost all of our deltas are final minus initial. Delta E is Q plus W. This equation here um, relates to the, the change of energy for a process as its heat change and its work change. 
Um, and so delta E is the state function. It's the one that's um, always the same value no matter how you carry a reaction out. But depending on how you carry a reaction out, you can get different Q and W values. So what this would mean is if you carry a reaction out one way, it maybe has a negative 10 delta E, but Q is negative 5, W is negative 5. Um, or W is negative 8 and W is negative 2. So they just have to sum, Q and W have to sum still to the delta E value, but they can be anything. So Q and W depend on how we're carrying the reaction out. Um, and so then Q is negative when heat's released, and then W is negative when we're moving an object. So we heat something up, Q's negative, we move an object, W's negative. So the piston expands, W negative. The piston contracts, W is positive. Okay. So if we're doing work on the reaction, if, um, uh, if we're uh, um, heating the reaction up, that's Q positive. If we're pushing down on the piston, that's W positive. Um, enthalpy is E plus PV. This probably isn't an equation that has much utility other than just trying to understand that enthalpy had some relationship to work. As long as we were in an open system, then work disappeared. And our delta H became exactly equal to the heat change. And so work, this was looking at the pressure volume change for work. This was just used to help us see our delta H and the work kind of disappears at constant pressure. And so our delta H was, you know, we were just using that P delta V to help us see that as long as we're at constant pressure, then our enthalpy change is our heat change. So our delta H is our heat change at constant pressure. Uh, so at constant pressure, we're not moving a piston. We can't increase pressure. How can you move anything? So that's the idea there. Uh, Q is MCS delta T is useful for like heating up um, an object, heating up a piece of metal, heating up water. Uh, we did problems like where you had the heat of the metal, like iron or something, where like you, like you remember the problems you saw, like hot, hot iron, this was the negative the heat of water. Um, so the iron was losing heat, water was gaining heat. This was getting us into system versus surroundings, system being the opposite, the heat change of the surroundings. Uh, now, Q reaction, C cal times delta T. This is our bomb calorimetry equation. So this was used in our bomb calorimetry. Um, the other bomb calorimetry, which isn't exactly shown, it's kind of maybe related to this equation here, but the coffee cup calorimetry, if you recall, our Q reaction was negative MCS delta T for the solution. So for the coffee cup um, constant pressure calorimetry problems. We were setting up our heat change of the reaction negative of its surroundings. That's why we have the negative sign here. The surroundings is the solution. So our bomb calorimetry, the calorimeter is the surroundings. So we had our Q reactions negative heat capacity. The calorimeter is just one energy uh, per Kelvin and then times our delta T. Remember delta T's and Kelvin are the same as degree C's. The, mentioned this a bunch of times, sometimes we get this mixed up on the exam, but a delta T in degree C is the same as a delta T in Kelvin. 25 to 26 degree C is 298 to 299 Kelvin. Both of those are one degree C or one Kelvin increases in temperature. So then our delta H of reaction is the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants. Very basic use of delta HF values, the formation enthalpies. Um, so formation enthalpies is the enthalpy it takes to form a compound, one mole of it, from its elements in their standard state. We'll see a few examples of that. Um, but the, uh, uh, we use those delta HF values to sum up the products, taking into account the coefficients, and then subtracting the reactants, taking into account the coefficients. And then anytime there's an element like H2 gas, Cl2 gas, F2 gas, those delta HFs are zero. Um, for the metallic elements, it would be the metal solid. Uh, except for mercury, which would be metal liquid. Br2 is a liquid, the only two liquid elements. And then so we go fluorine, chlorine, gas, gas, bromine, liquid, iodine goes then solid. Um, I don't know if they would test you an I2 solid would be the delta HF zero for iodine, but that's how that would go for iodine. And then the one I alluded to earlier, our delta H of reaction bonds, enthalpies of broken bonds minus the bond enthalpies of the formed bonds. So these are the reactants, bonds being broken. And then these are the products bonds being formed. And this is also maybe best thought of as an approximation. Uh, for everything else in this chapter being a direct calculation, this is an approximation technique, not a direct calculation. So I think it's important to know that that really only gives you an approximation of the delta H. 
Okay, since we didn't get any equations for chapter five, I just wanted to start with the equations and some of those so we can talk about those. Um, and then let's look at some problems here. How many of you guys looked at the review problems? Just trying to get a sense of if most of you guys, I see a few hands. Um, okay, so we have a balloon filled with air at room temperature. It's immersed then into liquid nitrogen, where liquid nitrogen's temperature is way down at 77 Kelvin. And so we're dropping the temperature. The, the uh, air inside the balloon has to drop in temperature. And so the heat in the balloon has to be dropping in that process. So that would make our Q negative because we have to lose heat. Um, so the air molecules are going to lose heat as they cool down. And then the balloon's going to shrink. We're told it shrivels up. I think you would expect that. It, we'll, we'll talk about gas laws in chapter 10 if you don't know why that's the case. But the balloon's going to shrivel up and decrease in size. And so the contraction is the surroundings working on the contents of the balloon. And so that should be W greater than zero. So the surroundings are going to work on the balloon as it, as it um, contracts. So this is what contraction looks like. And then expansion would be the opposite. Like if the balloon expands, it's moving the surroundings. Moving the surroundings would be negative for work. So I always try to think heating up the surroundings is Q negative. Well, that's a different thought. But Q negative generally for heating up the surroundings, and then W negative for moving the surroundings. This is a little bit maybe slightly confusing here because the temperature is dropping from the surroundings temperature dropping, and then the air is just matching that temperature. Um, the previous where I was thinking about a process that releases heat, that's not then thinking of a chemical reaction. So a chemical reaction wasn't taking place to lead to this um, change. The surroundings temperature changed. The air was matching that surroundings temperature by losing heat. So we go Q negative, w, w positive for the answer for this one. So a lot of these questions are just trying to make sure we get the, the heat flow uh, correct and then the workflow kind of correct on what the sign should be for heat and work. So question one, what change leads to a release of energy? So release of energy is, of course, going to be the exothermic reaction. Um, and so separating two cations from each other, that should lead to the release of energy. So that's going to be exothermic. Um, the breaking of a chemical bond if I had something like H2 or whatever the bond is, I have to add energy. Two things bond together, energy has to be applied to separate them. If you go back to the bond enthalpy chart at the end of chapter five, they're all positive. There's no negative bond enthalpies. So it's always going to take energy input to break the bond, not energy being released. Uh, bringing two anions together, if we wanted to take two negatively charged particles, that are far apart and bring them closer together, that's going to take energy. Um, so we don't release energy in that process. We have to have energy absorbed. So the only process here that leads to a release of energy is A. So a salt dissolves in water. The temperature of the water drops. So the, the, the water temperature dropping, is that the surroundings or is that the reaction? That's the surroundings. The surroundings temperature is dropping, so the surroundings is losing heat. And the surroundings must be losing heat. Where did the heat go? It went to the reaction that absorbed it. So our signs here, Q reaction negative Q surroundings. So if the surroundings is losing heat, then the reaction must be absorbing that heat. And so if the temperature is dropping in the solution, then we had an endothermic reaction take place. And so our Q reaction positive, Q surroundings negative. I want to try to go quick, but if I go too fast or if there's any follow-up questions, feel free to interrupt me. A blank delta H corresponds to a blank process. Looks like negative, negative, positive, or zero. So does a negative delta H correspond to an exo or endothermic process? So a negative delta H would be an exo, and a positive would be an endo. So, so the negative, exothermic. So the positive would be endothermic, 
And then delta H zero would just, I don't know if there's a word for it, it would just be isoelectronic, I guess. <laughs> so, so these are just choices to be there that aren't the right answer. So which of the following should be endothermic? And so phase changes are ones we can usually understand the sign change. So if we're going from solid to liquid to gas, we have to be absorbing heat to go from solid to liquid to gas. And then if you go backwards and you're releasing heat. So if you start with the gas, you have to release energy to go back into the liquid, back into the solid. And so uh, the uh, endothermic process should be melting, it should be boiling, but not freezing. And so we're just thinking, you know, you have to heat up the pot of water on the stove, that, that you're supplying the heat because that heat has to be absorbed by the water molecules. So state functions are the path independent functions. And so the path ind independent functions are like delta E and delta H. So if you imagine like an A to B taking place, and then you flip it going back to B to A, the state functions are, are the ones that are always, you can just easily flip the sign. Like if you carry a reaction out a certain way and you do heat and work, like you're moving a piston, you can't easily just flip it and then move the piston backward and put the thing back together. It doesn't exactly work if you flip a reaction like you can flip like a phase change. And so, but um, if you had a reaction taking place at constant uh, pressure or whatever, where delta H is the heat change, then there is no work being done. And so however much heat you got out of the reaction, if you put that heat back in, it should go backwards. Or it would be the exact delta H to flip the reaction. So the path independent functions are the ones that if you flip the reaction B to A, you just flip the sign. Um, but if you had a reaction where heat and work was being done by the reaction, and then you flip it, the heat and work, it's hard to know how they flip. They don't exactly flip because they're not path independent. They depend on how the reaction is being carried out. So Q and W are the prototypes in the chapter for the path, uh, the path dependent or the non-state functions. So these are path dependent. They depend on how the path's being carried out. So path independent state functions are delta E and delta H, that's internal energy and enthalpy. So delta E is just the internal energy, delta H is the uh, enthalpy change. Now, as far as like most of our chemical systems are concerned, delta E and delta H are synonymous with each other because there's no work being done. So when you get rid of work, these two become uh, very synonymous with each other. So if you're thinking, what's the difference between delta E and delta H? Well, for a chemical system, really not much. Um, you know, the heat change is the energy change. Um, the, uh, if you have a mechanical system, then the sum of the heat and the work change would be your delta E. So like your delta H plus your work change would be your delta E. So the one here that was kind of maybe confusing was pressure. You know, like, so how do we know pressure is a path uh, dependent function? And I think that's just getting into um, that the, the, the pressure starts to be related to the work. If you remember, there's an equation related pressure and work. So pressure and work become related together. And so pressure would be then oh, a path dependent function. OK, so let's look at a calorimetry problem. Um, we have 6.60 grams of calcium chloride, 110.98 uh, grams per mole, dissolves into 100 grams of water in a coffee cup calorimeter. Temperature goes 23 to 34 degrees C. Calculate the delta H for the solution process in kJs per mole. And we're assuming the specific heat of the solution is that of pure water. And we're giving that value 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. And so this coffee cup problem here, that the very basic start is that the Q reaction is negative Q of the uh, surroundings. The surroundings is the solution. And the solution is the negative MCS delta T of that entire solution. And now this is the heat change occurring inside the calorimeter. So once we get this Q reaction, we're going to have to somehow relate it to delta H for the process in like kJs per mole. So we're going to have kind of a two-step process. So my Q reaction will be negative. Now it's the mass of the solution. So it's the 100 grams plus the 6.6. .6, so negative 106.6 grams. 
Now, technically, we should be using the CS of the solution, not just the water, but we're told to assume the CS is that of water. So then we go times 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. And then times our delta T final minus initial. And I just forced the issue to make sure degree C and Kelvin, we see that it's fine to cancel them because it's a delta T. 11.0 degree C would be equal to that same value in Kelvin if we wanted to convert to Kelvin. Occasionally I see students go 11.0 to Kelvin, so plus 273, you see how that would be a mistake, right? So the delta T is not 284 Kelvin, it's 11 Kelvin or 11 degree C. Okay, and so then the minus sign here, again, sometimes we get confused on, you know, do I put this here if it's exothermic? Do I have to think about that? Not necessarily. I'm just thinking the key change is the negative of the surroundings. And then I'm just doing the delta T is the final minus initial. So as long as we keep the minus sign there and we calculate our delta T correctly, if it's exo, it should come out negative. If it's endo, it should come out positive. This should be exothermic because the solution's going up. So we should get negative, and we are going to get negative. So we go negative 106.6 times 4.18 times uh, 11. That's negative 4,090, or negative 4,900. Let's divide by 1,000 to go to KJ's here. So 1,000 joules per kilojoule. Since the answer is in KJ's per mole, let's go ahead and convert to KJ's. So that's 4.90, negative. Now, the way we do the next step is we try to identify whatever the limiting reactant is, which is only one reactant here, it's the calcium chloride dissolving, because the next problem is, you know, what do we put here? The water, do we put the solution, do we put the one thing, we put the limiting reactant, whatever it was that was, the, the thing that limits the heat here is how much calcium chloride is dissolving. If I could dissolve more, the t temperature change would have been higher. If I dissolve less, temperature change would have been lower. So the thing that's really leading to the release of heat is the calcium chloride and how much of it there was. And so that's why I'm, I'm putting that here. And so then I just need to go kJs per gram into kJs per mole. So I just use the molar mass. So just about everything you need a molar mass for in this test is probably going to be given to you so that you don't have to waste time calculating a molar mass. So divide our answer to the previous step by 6.6 .6 times 110.98. I get negative 82.4. Call it negative 82.5. So now this step here, again, it's usually we do a limited reaction in a calorimeter. We do some smaller quantity and we want to usually go back to moles. So usually we get our heat change. You can think heat change per gram, then go heat change per mole. Now, a couple variations, or probably the only other main variation on a problem like this would be to give you the delta H, and give you the quantity still, like 6.6 .6 grams, and then ask you for the temperature change, or ask you for the final temperature, given initial temperature. So I think you can see that if we had the delta H, then we could solve for the Q reaction. Then we can plug the Q reaction in and solve for our delta T and then get our final temperature that way. So the main variation of this problem would just be, well, let's give you a delta H. There's some problems on daily quizzes that I think you'll see that give you the delta H, give you the mass, give you the initial temperature, and ask you for the final temperature. So if you get that variation of the problem, take the, your delta H, try to then say, well, how much, what would the heat change in the calorimeter be? for the limited quantity of reaction taking place, and then from Q reaction, try to solve for delta T, from delta T, try to solve for the final. I don't think so. So for a data entry question, I think you would only put the negative sign, but not plus. So yeah, and I think, I'm not entirely sure where you can input negative numbers either, so you may not even get one if it's negative. <laughs> But I, I'm not entirely sure about that. But so yeah, definitely don't put a plus. No units, just the number to whatever uh, placeholder. So whenever you get those number uh, problems, remember it'll always say to the nearest one or the nearest tenths place um, and just report your answer. And then if you do ever, if it says to go to the nearest tenth and your answer ends in zero, the zero will disappear and that's okay. So 
I think there's only four or five data entry questions on the upcoming exam. So I think there's a couple fewer than midterm. Okay. So phosphoric acid is prepared by this reaction here. We're told when 25.8 grams of phosphoric acid is produced, so we're making some product, 10.9 kilojoules of heat is evolved. Now, this is, means given off. So if heat's given off, that is um, heat being released by the reaction. And so that's the Q reaction being negative 10.9 kilojoules, right? So heat being given off 10.9, if heat were being absorbed, would be, you know, would be the, the plus 10.9. So heat would have to be absorbed for this to be positive 10.9. And so the delta H for the overall reaction isn't negative 10.9, because this was just the heat being given off by the 25.8 grams of H3PO4. And so then what we'd want to do is two steps here. We'd want to do a gram to mole conversion. So we go 98.0 grams per mole of phosphoric acid. That would be the heat change in KJs per mole of H3PO4. But then we look at our reaction. There's four moles of H3PO4. So we got to then go times four moles of H3PO4 to get the overall delta H of the reaction. So it's like we're saying the heat change per mole of H3PO4, the balanced reaction has four moles of H3PO4 being produced, so that's why we have to multiply by four. So we go negative 10.9, divide by 25.8, times the molar mass, times four. So negative 165.6, so negative 166 for answer A. Now, I feel like this hasn't been stressed a whole lot that a delta H is always in units of kJs. And it's kJs per mole as indicated in the reaction. So it's per one mole of P4O10, per six moles of water, per four moles of H3PO4. So the delta H of the reaction always in units of kJs, and that's the heat per four moles of H3PO4. So if we're ever doing a problem related to a delta H, that's the, the, the Q reaction is that value, and then per four moles of H3PO4, or per six moles of water, or per four moles of P4O10. So the next problem is the, the coffee cup, or excuse me, the uh, bomb calorimetry example, where we have vanillin, uh, certain qu quantity, it's just an organic compound being combusted in the presence of excess oxygen inside a calorimeter. The total heat capacity of the calorimeter is given. The key to notice here, in case you're not entirely sure how to solve this problem in the test, is to notice that there's no gram unit. It's just kJs per kel Kelvin. So we're just going to multiply this by our delta T. So our Q reaction, still the negative Q of the surroundings. The surroundings in this form of calorimetry is assumed to be the entire calorimeter, where you have a bomb vessel surrounded by a bunch of water. So the water, the bomb vessel, everything surrounding this reaction is part of the calorimeter. So this is what we call the total uh, heat, is described by the total heat capacity as being negative C-cal times delta T. And in a lot of ways, these problems are simpler as long as we recognize the simplicity here. And we're already in KJs, too. So we have that already converted for us. So we just go negative from the Q reaction, negative Q surrounding. So negative 9.795 KJs per Kelvin. And then times our delta T. And so our final minus initial. Really easy to see that that's just 3.3. 349 degrees C, or 3.349 Kelvin. So our Kelvin unit cancels, so we just go negative 9.795 times 3.349. That's negative 32.8. So now one way you can know that it's not the direct answer, if that, it's not a choice, luckily, but if that were a choice, you know it's not the answer because we don't see the per mole. 
So this is the heat change per limiting reactant here, which is the vanillin, the 1.2554. I don't know why they didn't give us that molar mass, but it's 12.01 times eight plus 1.008 times eight plus 16 times three. So that's 152 grams per mole. So 32.8 negative divided by 1.2554, the limiting reactant here, converting it to moles, 39.70, kJs per mole. Okay, so Q reaction, negative C cal times delta T, and then that heat change per limiting reactant for 1.2554 grams of vanillin, and just, I had to work out its molar mass real quick and just go molar mass grams to moles to go to kJs per mole. Question six, which of those things has a delta HF of zero? Sodium is a metal, should be a solid, so sodium solid. So all of these things here are not the elemental forms, but you know, if you imagine having solid sodium, it should take heat to get to the gas, right? So the sodium gas, we can even predict that the delta HF of sodium gas should be positive, because it kind of has to go from the gas to liquid to, uh, from the solid to liquid to gas, has to absorb all that heat to, to form a gas. Same thing with sodium liquid, should be positive. I don't know about the sign of aqueous sodium ion, but this here, I just know that that's not the most uh, stable form of sodium. That's not its elemental form. So that would not be zero by definition. Then how we use delta HFs, uh, or sorry, this is a Hess's law problem. Um, so for Hess's law, we're rearranging our reaction to sum up to the desired reaction. So I'm looking here, I see iron here, iron here, but there's two. So I need to double this reaction here. So I need to double the magnitude of that delta H. And then my FeCl3, this reaction here needs to be flipped. And then FeCl2 cancels. And then our two Fe's plus three chlorines go to FeCl3. And I just had to flip this delta H of the second reaction because I flipped the reaction. So Hess's law is how do you need to change the reactions? How do you need to flip or double or cut that coefficients in some fraction? How do you have to change those coefficients? And then how do you sum up the reactions? We're just trying to add these up to our desired reaction. And so it'd be two times negative 341.8 and then plus negative 115.4 that's 799. So these are just a puzzle. Now, two reactions is a simpler puzzle than three or four reactions, but just know a couple things. One, if we give you like three reactions, you usually have to use all three. Sometimes you get a little confused and thinking, oh, maybe we gave you a reaction you don't need to use. We usually don't get that cute. You might think we'd get that cute, but usually we don't. Um, so if we give you a reaction, you should probably have to use it as part of your balancing. Um, Sometimes there's a reaction that's used to balance some of the intermediates. So sometimes that's why the third or fourth reaction is there to balance out some of the other things that you don't want in the overall balanced reaction. So you might be able to get some of your reactants lined up with two of the reactions. The third one maybe is used to get rid of the things that we call intermediates. Let's um, end on this slide here. So um, what is the formation reaction? The formation reaction is forming whatever the compound is from its elements, but the elements have to be in their standard state. And then we have to form the compound as a product, and we want there to be one mole of it. So one mole of products in B and C, so those possibly could be the formation reactions, but carbon solid, technically graphite would probably be better to be specified here, but carbon solid, H2 gas, those are the elemental forms of carbon and hydrogen. That's our formation reaction. This is not C2H2, you know, and C is not the elemental form of carbon. Um, these aren't even forming one mole of compound. Um, this is almost a reaction, but six hydrogens, hydrogen atom is not the uh, uh, elemental form of hydrogen H2 is. And so that's wrong here. And then the answer A is just completely bogus. So we're forming one mole of compound from its elements in their standard states. 
And then I think this one here will just leave the idea is we're summing up the product. So three times CH4s, delta HF plus CO2s plus two times waters, summing those all up, keeping track of the negative signs, and then subtracting the reactants. So we sum all these up, and then we subtract the reactants. And now H2 is zero. So the H2 reactant on the reactant side is zero. So we're then subtracting four times COs delta HF. Okay, there's a key up online for the other questions. And we'll go through some of these next time, getting into the bond enthalpy one next. So um, that's it for today. Have a great fall break. I'll see you back here Monday. Um, I have an office hour Friday from like 1 to 2.30. I forget what the specific time. It's in the email I sent out. So if you're around on Friday and you're on campus, I have an office hour Friday afternoon. But have a great break. And see you back next week.